I immediately cut 10% of the workforce, asked the rest to reduce 10% of their pay and delayed the bonuses for everybody above associate director. We still paid three months later with interest. And if I contrast that, looking back, all those decisions were completely wrong. They were decisions of an immature CEO who did not have that experience of handling a crisis before. You know, fast forward to 2020, the pandemic hit. My first response was assuring everybody that we'll put people over profit. Not a single person will lose their job. Not a single person will see a rupees pay cut. Because I knew at that time what people want is stability, surety, security. And a leader's job is not to add to that insecurity at the time is to create that security and you know, luckily because I was CEO for such a long time it's about making mistakes but learning from them. So Vishesh you have a very impressive journey and I'm going to share some highlights and uh, you're someone who quickly soared from the role of national managing partner and currently serve as the CEO of Grand Thought in Bharat. With over 20 years of experience, you've been instrumental in driving growth and transformation at Grand Thought in Bharat, propelling the firm to new heights. Your visionary leadership has shaped the firm as the leading professional services in the country, leaving a lasting impact on clients and on people alike. As a respected industry figure, you've also actively engaged in industry leaders. Uh, you've actively engaged with industry leaders and policymakers, advocating for positive changes. With your wealth of knowledge and experience, we are incredibly privileged to have you on our campus here at Masters Union. With that, let's just have a huge round of applause. Welcome to the campus. Thank you very much. I haven't come very far. I work out of Aero City, live around the corner. So absolutely delighted to be here. Thank I you for taking out the time. The fact that you took out time, even though it's not very far, means a lot still. Thank you so much. Great. So, uh, Vishesh, you've been in Grand Thornton for almost 18, 18 and a half years is what I saw on LinkedIn. Uh, and I'm sure a lot has changed from the time when you started to today as the CEO of Grand Thornton Bharat. So, what were some key milestones as you look back on your journey? Yeah, so it's actually a 30-year journey. Okay. It's not an 18-year journey. Okay. <clears throat> really, the 30-year journey at the firm for me, the first part was training to be a chartered accountant with Grant Thornton in the UK. I actually did a small stint of training with the firm here just before that. So I'll just touch on that also. I then came back to India and co-founded the you know, what's now called GT Bharat. Mm -hmm. And then in 2007 became uh, the national managing partner, which effectively was the CEO. It's got, you know, the title got rebranded some years out. So it's been about 15 years to 2007 you know, from trainee to CEO, mm -hmm. and then 15 years from there to now, where we are. Um, so I can, you know, break, break it up into those parts. So my first part, beginning my article training, as it's called. Anyone here attempted article training? CA articles? Okay, so, uh, you know, today what you see in terms of articles and, you know, doing whatever, I can tell you in the early 90s, the standards were totally different. You were thrown into one of these conference rooms. The conference room was filled with vouchers. You were given different colored pens and you had to go, you know, use tick marks and not even tick marks like you all use. It's a reverse tick mark. It was so disappointing. It was so disappointing that experience. The standards were so poor. The experience was so disappointing and the work was you know, so menial. Yeah that I was like, I can't build a career doing this. I have to do something different. And that's when I you know, went to the UK, did mm. a master's in business and management, which you can convert effectively like an MBA, uh, because Indians needed a four year you know, graduation. Mm. I'd done graduation here at St. Stephen's before, uh, and then ended up doing my CA in the UK. Now CA in the UK, so this is years uh, now 1995 till 1998, I can tell you, was a massive culture shock for me, you know, coming from India. Uh, culture shock in all ways. I remember in my first week at the firm, this lady came to me and said, uh, uh, so Vishesh, how long have you been in the UK? I said, I've been here a year. I was doing the master's course, right? She said, oh, I'm so glad to hear that. No wonder your English is so good. They didn't have a clue about, you know, you know, the world outside. So many ways. I, I done okay. I 
passed my CA exams, passed first time. Past percentages there are much higher than here. So don't think I was, you know, exceptional or super intelligent or something. But I was lucky enough to pass exams first time. So that was the second part of the training. The third part was then uh, coming back and founding the firm here. Mm -hmm. I effectively co-founded the GT platform in India. We had an old relationship with GT, but there were, it was a mess. GT was two much smaller firms, but had the potential. And I, I really saw that potential. I saw because of my training and what I gained from that in the UK. Despite all those challenges, I learned a lot. And from my training and what I gained from that, I could see the direction of the wind. People want to work in international brands. Clients want to work with enterprises that have a global scale. And I could see India Inc. wanting to go on that you know, global journey. I could also see that our platform had access to an international brand, right. which was not leveraged at the time. The association with GT went back to 1970 uh, with the audit firm, but it wasn't called that. I remember in a conversation, I asked the then partners that we should rebrand to GT. We should call ourselves Grant Thornton. They're like, we are a 80 year old firm. GT is not known. Mm. Why would we rebrand ourselves GT? Like, because you haven't promoted it. Yeah. That's why it's not known. If you want to be seen to be an international firm, then call yourselves that at the moment. Don't confuse the market. So I guess that's the lesson there that pick Pick the market you want to face and, you know, focus your brand on that. So that was founding the firm. And then, you know, obviously it's about building the firm in stages. That's what we did. I remember when at that time we were 50 people, uh, 50 people mm. in 2001, where we started. It was one office. It was scaling the firm from there. And then, of course, in 2007, as CEO, my job was, by then we were seven, 800 people, was to now think out of the box, how do we create a brand that can sit side by side with the other, by then four large firms that were there. First it was just, you know, being a challenger and having a seat at the table, but then how do you very quickly create a fifth? And that's what I did. And then fast forward to now, we are considered part of India's big five. Uh, we are India's largest accounting consulting firm. Last time I checked, we were 9,200 people. So nearly, nearly 10,000 people uh, will be by the end of this year. And as I said, you know, very clearly focused to be Grant Thornton Bharat, whilst we are part of that, you know, Indian big five, uh, you know, want to be seen to be different from everybody else, you know, and we can talk more about that. So that's really wow. been that journey from, uh, you know, starting my training here, training at GT UK, uh, the challenges of coming back and setting up, you know, the platform here, and then to now where we are. Wow, that's one hell of a journey, Vishesh. And I'm like my brain is just recreating that scene of, you know, coming back uh, with that brand that, oh, you're lazy and you're not really doing meaningful contribution in GT UK to actually being the youngest uh, board member for the global board of GT and the journey that you covered. And I, I hear from you that there was a lot of resistance also on the Indian side, like you mentioned, because the firm was like, why should we rebrand, etc. What are some guiding principles that have always, um, like, you know, helped you in such times? How do you uh, yeah. have that vision that, you know, this is yeah. where you want to go and how do you lead the team to then follow you? Yeah, I should also said, by the way, so I was uh, recently asked to join the leadership team of the UK firm. So the firm I was a trainee in, in 1995, hmm. asked me to join their leadership team. So now I sit on their board and their leadership team of the UK because they want to learn from India and what we've achieved here. That's you know, that, uh, that same firm. Uh, and... Yeah, so some of the lessons really over that journey, I mean, come to the guiding principle, but some mm. of the lessons were, first of all, no and no, mm. right? I did not let anyone tell me no, and I knew when to say no. So that'd be the first lesson, that don't let anyone tell you you are not capable, this is not possible, you don't have it in you, this can't be done. Of course, if someone asks you to jump from top of this building without a parachute, and all you have to have a strategy, yeah. you can still do it, you can get a rope, you can you know, still do it, but you've got to think about it. So don't take every challenge, but most things, most things can be done. So it's that nothing is impossible. At the same time, you have to know when to say no, right? That's the big difference between people who are successful in the long run versus someone who doesn't have the ability to say no. That'll be the first lesson. I think the uh, uh, second lesson I would say over that is the most important decision in my view is 
the life partner you all will choose. Yeah. And of course, if you don't choose the life partner, that's fine. Uh, but if you were to choose one, I think that would be the most important decision you all would make. And I can certainly say that about myself. Yeah. The amount I've, you know, learned, benefited, stayed on course because of the individual I chose uh, is the second lesson I'd say. Somebody I met when I was in England, and we can talk more about that. I think the third, third one is luck. You have to count on luck. There isn't much more than that, you know, at least for me. Uh, luck has to, to play a big role. Wow. I actually have a follow-up question on the first two principles, the no and no. Yeah. When you are in a leadership position, it's easier for you to like, you know, call the shots, say no. But for a lot of our students who will probably still start at, say, mid-senior levels, there are a lot of repercussions sometimes of saying no on your personal self. Yeah. There are also thoughts that, okay, if I am seen in a specific light in this company, it will also impact my ability to find an alternative career in the next role, wherever I go, because nobody wants a troublemaker either. How do you build that balance of being able to say no or to be able to call out uh, shit when that happens? Because my grandfather taught me that. The most important thing as a professional, you have to know when to tell a client that's the door. Right. For the rest of the time, you're there to let them have your shoulder to cry on. Right? And right. to celebrate their happiness. So I, I don't think, uh, but I agree, you know, it's, mm. not, it's not that straightforward. Mm. I'd only say that obviously don't be disruptive for the sake of being disruptive. Right. But at the same time, you don't get noticed if you, if you want to just, you know, play the course. Right. And eventually it's about being the purple cow, as uh, Seth Gordon calls it. Mm. You know, Seth is the, most of you, would know one of the marketing gurus written many books. I'm sure you study some of his books. Right. But he, he's written a very simple book called The Purple Cow. You must read it. Very, very simple. It just talks about how you need to stand out amongst others. So I think saying no is one way to stand out. Having and an I, opinion. Saying no is having an opinion and expressing that opinion. I don't think anyone is comfortable expressing an opinion. You think I'm comfortable sitting here after so many times sitting on such stages and doing this? No, I was super nervous, super terrified. Uh, but it gets easier and easier. Yes. It gets easier and easier. You know, I, I mean, going back 15 years, it was very hard. Still, right. I, it's not easy. So, yeah. No, I think, so, and also the UK example was great where, you know, if you don't give me more work and I'm coming for two hours, then there you took a stand for yourself. And I think that at least helped you, like, help put that statement out that, you know, I'll not be taken for a ride yeah. is the least that you can do for yourself. Yeah, a considered stand, right. expressed respectfully of course not in a challenging way correct and that's what you need to do you know mm. if you uh, that you have to understand where the authority lies right you can't encourage insubordination mm. but that's what you have to do and you whatever the repercussions it's okay it doesn't matter you, you have to prove to yourself not to anybody else mm. remember that right? right it doesn't matter don't fear being judged by others right no oh, fantastic and you mentioned about your life partner and i'm sure a lot of our students are in that zone where they either are evaluating a life partner or will at some point soon. Uh, also MBA is like a great place. I, I see a lot of marriages happening in our previous cohorts. So yeah. so if you have, if you go back in your time and you were uh, thoughtfully thinking out of, you know, your life partner, was it a decision uh, that you thought through? Was there a checklist that you had or w what was your strategy for it? Yeah, so uh, my checklist was very clearly, it does not matter where the person comes from or what religion they were or you know anything else it was only does the person have the values that i'll be able to respect mm. you know, does the person have the values that i would like my children to have because in the long run mm. that is what matters right yeah. that's what you will respect it's not how you know how you know what a person looks like or you know everything else that initially attract you of course mm. all that is also hugely important right but I think that's what that's what I was looking for. You know, mm. the values, individual, and the, uh, you know, was there a matching of those values right. between that individual and me? And could I see the individual being a great mother to my children, mm. the kind of mother that I wanted, you know, for my children? Again, we can talk more about it. She was Muslim. She was not only Muslim. She came from across the border. She grew wow. up in you know our neighboring country, mm. uh, and yeah, I did not hesitate to make the choices to go through the hardships, to fight with my family if I had to, in order to marry her. Because I knew, you know, she has the values that 
I wanted my kids to have. Well, that's that's incredible, and I'm sure like you're uh, very fortunate to have her by your side. I'm Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. Uh, fantastic. So um, you mentioned you know about the team size being 50 when you uh, started long back. Today to today being 9,200 uh, people strong, and I'm sure you know as you build such a large team, there are multiple challenges, foreseen, unforeseen, etc. Would love to hear some of those uh, yeah. journey or challenges that came on the way as you grew. So I think in the initial years, the single biggest challenge was funding the growth. Hmm. You've been in a startup, you know that. We didn't know where we were going to pay the next salary bill of our employees from. You know, when we're 50, 100, 200, 400, 800, 1,200. So managing working capital and raising finance was the first thing that was necessary to fund that growth. Right. At the time, challenges, things like the global financial crisis, you know, in 2008, we were initially told India's decoupled. I don't know, you all were <clears throat> probably too young, but some of you would remember at the global financial crisis, our finance minister, the regime, everyone said India's decoupled. India has no impact on the global financial crisis. Ka. This, you know, is all for the Western markets. And soon enough, it hit us. People stopped paying our bills, stopped, uh, you know, spending discretionary discretionary spends on consulting kind of things and consulting thrives on discretionary spends right let's do a business plan growth divestiture acquisition all those things go into consulting so uh, global financial crisis was a huge challenge and i immediately cut 10 percent of the workforce asked the rest to reduce 10 percent of their pay mm -hmm. and delayed the bonuses for everybody above associate director. So all directors, partners, no bonuses, delayed. Uh, we still paid three months later with interest, but those are the steps we took. And if I contrast that, looking back, all those decisions were completely wrong. They were decisions of an immature CEO who did not have that experience of handling a crisis before. Uh, you know, fast forward to 2020, the pandemic hit my first, first response was assuring everybody that we'll put people over profit. Mm. Not a single person will lose their job. Not a single person will see a rupees pay cut at the firm. Because I knew at that time what people want is stability, surety, security. And a leader's job is not to add to that insecurity mm. at the time, is to create that security. And luckily, because I was CEO for a long time, yeah. uh, it's about making mistakes, but learning from them. Again, hindsight's 2020, and uh, you know I, I can say very easily today that you know, the decisions I took in 2008, nine were wrong. Who knows? If we hadn't taken those decisions, we may not have survived. Mm -hmm. But you know, in balance, I can tell you that the response to a crisis needs to be more giving security versus firing uh, people. So uh, that was the other other big challenge. I think. Uh, the, the third biggest challenge in our business was in the early years, whether it was for people or clients, everybody was obsessed with big X, mm. right? At that time, big six, then big five, then big four. And I was like, you know, obviously we were significantly smaller, but why this size obsession, mm. right? So convincing people that in specific areas that we wanted to pick, we would be as good as anybody else right. and could compete with others. Right. Uh, but that was a big, big challenge on, you know, getting over that artificial barrier. So it wasn't the you know, individual brand of any firms. It was this halo provided by this, you know, big brand. Right. And that big brand exists only in this industry. Mm. There is not one other industry, one other industry where people say big X. Right. Do you check and ever say I'll fly the big three airlines in the world? No, right? You will fly the airline that gives you the cheapest or the best service or something you like. Right? Do you say, I'll pick the big three mobile phone carriers mm. in India? No. So it's only this industry where there's been this size obsession, mm. where actually it should be something different. So it was convincing. So that was a big, big challenge you know, that, we had to, that we had to deal with. But mm. we did that by picking pockets which were contemporary, US Gap, IFRS, global listings, things that we could compete with. Mm. you know, in a limited area. And all our talent came from those same big firms. Yeah, so those were, those were some of the uh, challenges and some of the learnings over that period. Very, very, very insightful, uh, Vishesh. Thanks for sharing those. 
Um, I want to switch gears a little bit and uh, talk about, you know, your uh, vision or your thought around uh, the vibrant Bharat or, you know, GT Bharat's Bharat piece of it. Yeah. And how do you look at it as your uh, strategy? Yeah, so as I said, as we're already now touching 10,000 people mm. being considered part of that India's big five, mm. what next? Is really how do you create a differentiated firm that will put India first? Right. And that can be India's biggest consulting firm, that can be India's biggest audit firm, that, that can, you know, put Indian interests first. And we are, you know, by combining with GT across the world, uh, we want to create an Indian equivalent mm. over time. Mm. We work with all those, you know, other firms, uh, you know, on partnerships, on collaboration, but we want to create India's first firm. How do we do that? By the kind of clients we choose, mm. the markets we want to face, and automatically the kind of services we create for right. those markets. Mm. So our focus from very early on has been on Indian companies who are global, right? Not MNCs who want to work in India. Indian companies who are global, who want to globalize. Really putting Indian companies at the fore mm. and being their advisors first. Right. By building that reputation, as I said, we've ended up working for many multinationals. The second big part has been the bottom of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. You know, the inclusion agenda of the government, which automatically took us to food and agro, mm. right? Agro processing, food, farming, all that area. We are the market leaders in sports consulting, in uh, you know, things like women's self-help groups, helping women mm. enter the workforce. You're familiar with women's self-help groups? Yes. Right? So you, you'll study that. We actually work with those groups, mm. help them create you know, those groups, open a bank account, and then market their product direct to market. Mm. So through some of the things we do, choosing you know, Indian companies who are global, bottom of the pyramid, etc., is how we help shape a better India. And that's what we want to be, India's, not just India's largest consulting accounting firm, but create the first Indian big four in the next 10 odd years right. by uh, directly having now India hopefully acquiring some of the key markets in the world that will be run out of India. And my vision really is eventually, you know, by 2035, 2040, that you know, GT globally should have India at the center right. um, in its ecosystem. My next question for you is that what's the current state of uh, business landscape in India. If you want to really build a business, you've got to work not in the business, but on the business, right? So it is all, all part of that. You've got to work you know, on the business, not in the business. As part of that, you've got to look after yourself. How do you look after yourself? How do you look after yourself? You've got to look after yourself by obviously keeping yourself physically fit, mm. eat well, sleep well, uh, you know, stay physically active, but also continue to learn. And all these external organizations give that uh, right. you know, opportunity to connect with peers. I mean, there's no doubt this is the golden era for India. Right. You all are very lucky. We are all very lucky when we are born. Hmm. So there's absolutely no doubt in anybody's mind and my mind that this is the golden era for India, you know, the years from 20, 2000 till 2050, right? It is going to see that massive transformation. Our Prime Minister and the regime talks about Amrit Kal, uh, which is 2047. Right, India, India at hundred. Hmm. That's only twenty-five years out, right? Twenty-four years out from now. Go back to year two thousand when I started the firm hmm. or co-founded the India firm. That was twenty-four years before, right? So it's not that far away. And in that period, a period, India is going to transform from what three point four, three point five trillion as an economy to at least thirty-five trillion. Thirty-five trillion. As an economy, India was about four, five hundred billion in 2000, 2001. So we've seen about a seven X change. And from here is going to be a 10 X change, right. but with a much larger base. So you have to not do very much other than survive that vertical climb. Mm. It is a vertical climb. Right. And when a vertical climb happens, what happens? If you go to, Chan you know, if you sit on Chandrayaan and go to the moon, what happens? You get G-forces, you feel sick, you throw up, you, you're going to survive that, right? That's why you go through training and that's what you have to do. Hmm. And I think that's the big challenge for everybody here, that what steps do you have to take to obviously make the most of that vertical climb, but also survive it, not come under the bus. And you will see various individuals, various companies, could be me, could be GT, 
could be others who will come on the bus. Look at the names who have in the recent past. So that's oh, what you all okay. have to remember. The standards of the past don't apply in the future. In the past, a lot worked in India. You know, laws were meant to be broken, right? That's what people said. Laws are meant to be broken. Companies go insolvent. Promoters never do, mm. right? I remember my, 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 my father used to say this. You know, in India, companies go insolvent. Promoters never do. All that's changed. Mm. All that's changed. And yes, maybe the pendulum has swung too far the other way. Right. People will today say, you know, the kind of enforcement is too harsh, is, uh, you know, penal, it's stopping business, stopping entrepreneurship. But the other hand was a banana republic. You cannot, you know, want to be the third largest economy in the world and have a place where, you know, rules are meant to be broken. Right. Where companies go insolvent, ordinary investors lose money, but promoters never do. Mm. So things had to change. And, you know, things will come back in a few years to, you know, a more sensible place. So I think it's about that vertical climb, but surviving that vertical climb from here for most of us. And that'll mean a focus on governance, a focus on ethics, a focus on doing the right thing, on saying no, what I, what I said earlier, in my view. No, absolutely. And that's why we have it on the wall that fasten your seatbelt. This is going to be a bumpy ride uh, exactly. for, for the upward climb as well. Exactly. No, and in that bumpy ride, you know, what do they teach you? Put on your mask first before helping, helping the person next to you. Right? You will look after yourself. Yes. What I said earlier. Right. Look after yourself. But when you're building a business, let mm -hmm. me also add, when you're building a business, you've got to make sure that others succeed. Mm. Right? Other success, you have to put ahead of your success. So I can tell you for the first 10 years, I ensured everybody else made more money than I did. Mm. Right? People I recruited, I recruited people with multiple time uh, earnings of my own earnings. Mm. Right? And even today, at least in professional services, for anybody to be successful, that's the that's the sole way. Mm. You've got to ensure you make yourself redundant. And that's what people will tell you. The only way up is have the psychological safety, mm. have the confidence of recruiting somebody else to take on your job. Right. That's when you can ask for your boss's job. No, that's very valuable advice as uh, our students think of their careers. So my last question before I open it up for our students would be, um, you know, talent is of course at the heart of uh, anything that a company is doing. Like you said, there are almost 10,000 student, uh, 10,000 employees strong. And um, at Masters Union, we are a technology focused business school and we're trying to reimagine what business education should look like because I fundamentally believe that the job of training, et cetera, is not that of a company, but a lot of time companies are doing that job today because probably the education institutes are not doing what they're supposed to or not as much as they're supposed to or wherever the gaps are. So what are some of those gaps? What are the roles? What is the role that the education institutes should be playing more of? So just, just curious to hear that so that we can, as a business school, improve further. Yeah, I think you guys do a fantastic job with the partnership between industry and academia. Mm. I think, uh, you know, I've had the privilege to visit some of the best business schools in the world, one of which you studied at uh, yourself. What stood out for me in all those schools was the extent of research, innovation, partnership between industry and academia. So we have to focus on that. Right. I think for the second thing I'd say is the focus on teaching kids business ethics mm. and just ethics more generally. Right. I often say this, even if you go back to our schooling system in India, which is the one subject which has the lowest number of marks in school? Moral science or something. Moral science, civics, right? 20 marks. Even history, geography has more marks than that. Ethics, integrity, professional behavior. Focus on those things because that's what will help you all survive that vertical climb. Kotler and, you know, all Buchanan and, you know, all those books are great. You can read them on your own. You know, whenever and the sort of things you're doing, mm. that's what's important. I think because also technology, as you said, is accessible to everyone. You can go sign up to as many individual pieces of technical knowledge. What you will learn from is from your peers first, from your teachers after that, and on some of these things. And I think, uh, so yeah, so that ethics will be the second thing. And third, I'd say is, uh, you know, things like the right side of the brain, things like empathy, mm. like having an attitude of gratitude, 
what makes people happy. So we built our firm on culture and I can tell you the last five, seven years, that's what's really been the transformation. Mm. Uh, you need to have a strategy, you need to have a structure to deliver that strategy. But eventually it's all about culture. Culture is a very nebulous thing. Right. But culture is what you know, someone defined as what people do when nobody's watching. Mm. Yes. Right? Which you know, one of our culture tenets is assume positive intent. Mm. You've got to rethink everything. And that's why today, you know, we work on principles and then evolve everything based on that principle. So post the right. pandemic, one of those principles is ultra flex. Mm. Right? Ultra flex means that we want people to continue to benefit from some of the things of the pandemic, mm. having the opportunity to work from anywhere. Right. If they wow. if, if if that's what they like, mm. versus the need to come back to an office and work. In any case, in our business, people don't come to one office all the time. Very few right. people do that. Right? It is very important to also go into an office right. for certain things. Uh, we've changed our dress code. Before mm. the pandemic, you saw. You know, that used to be our dress code. I, I, it does not work with our environment, with our uh, uh, you know, weather with our, uh, you know, and, you know, I commute in a nice car, go from a, you know, air-conditioned environment to an air-conditioned environment. Mm. Just imagine the person in Mumbai who's commuting in a train, mm. right? Uh, I think during the pandemic, everything worked fine. Right. People delivered higher profits and better performance and on all our KPIs, NPS, ENPS, mm. everything that you say are our two biggest KPIs, even over profit. Mm. I saw the room called NPS. Right. <clears throat> so if that worked even during the pandemic, I don't know what people were wearing on top or below sitting behind those screens, right? Mm. And uh, so that's why this is our new dress code. So it's also a way to differentiate compared to everybody else. So yeah, so it's you know, the Ultraflex principle mm. and you know, we've tried to build the firm on principles which are aligned to our values mm. and which will shape our culture therefore. Fantastic and uh, I always see you being someone who's ahead of time in terms of, you know, bringing this culture, being more comfortable with just changing things. So kudos to you, as I said earlier also. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Vishesh, for such an insightful session. The entire journey of where you started from, your vision, uh, your uh, obsession with culture within your team and the culture that you're driving and being at the forefront of all this change, keeping Bharat at the heart of it all. Thank you so much for all the advice. Thank you for making the time. We're incredibly thankful for all the leadership lessons that you shared today. Thank you very much. I really hope uh, I know wish everybody here much success and Master Julian much success. I hope many of you create uh, big companies that will make India proud or join you know people like us who are trying to trying to do that. Thank you. Thank you.